Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a semi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today I wanted to talk a bit about Nickelodeon and the many allegations of abuse, more specifically the actions of their producer, Dan Schneider. Not only do I want to go over what Dan has done and how he gained his position of power in the first place, but it's important to take a look at Nickelodeon's role in this as well. Could they have prevented this? And if so, why didn't they? Now, today's topic will be discussing the sexualization of minors, sexual abuse and harassment, things of that nature. So if you are sensitive to these topics, then I'd recommend clicking off since they will be prevalent throughout the entirety of this episode. And with that being said, let's dive right into the episode and start with who Dan Schneider was and how he became such a powerful man at Nickelodeon. Let's get into it. Dan Schneider grew up in Memphis, Tennessee with a love of plays. Even though he was class president and attended Harvard, performing was always where Dan's passion lay. In an interview with the AV Club, Dan says he was never a great student and he only won the senior class president title because he gave a speech that got a lot of laughs. Dan states, After high school, I kind of floundered a bit. At that time, they were shooting a movie in Memphis. It was a big deal because it was the first time Hollywood had ever come to Memphis. My teacher in an acting class at Memphis State, now University of Memphis said, there's a role you might be able to get. There's a couple of speaking roles. I went to this big casting call for the movie Making the Grade. There was a sea of teenagers. They were doing extra casting as well. It was a huge mob scene. I almost left and this guy comes up to me and just sort of saw me and said, hey, are you here to audition for the film? I said, yeah. He said, come with me. I went to read with him and he turned out to be the producer. He didn't even know I had an appointment. He liked my face, I guess. He hired me for that movie and I was supposed to work for four days on it. It ended up being four weeks. Then he hooked me up with another film that was shooting in the Caribbean, Hot Resort. At the time, I was kind of blowing off school. I had a job. I worked at a store that sold Apple computers. I was fixing Apple computers. After the two movies, I was like, wow, I've never even left Memphis. I got two movies. Maybe I should go to LA and see what I can do. So I got a manager and an agent and that led to another movie or two that led to a TV show called Head of the Class. By the mid eighties, I was an actor. I was never super famous, but I was definitely on the map. Head of the Class was a pretty big hit on ABC in its day, though Dan claims that most people knew him from his role as Ricky in Better Off Dead. The movie, which Dan did when he was about 20 years old, aired in 1985. Though this may have been a nice feather in his cap for his acting career, more importantly, it eventually led him to meeting people that would allow him to establish a writing career. According to the New York Times, Dan co-hosted the second annual Kids' Choice Awards in 1988. It was there that he met Albie Hecht, an independent producer who landed at Nickelodeon as head of development. According to Dan, he ended up writing his pilot called All That, thinking it would be a part-time job. However, as many of you know, the show All That wasn't just a small program, but a staple of Nickelodeon itself. This would eventually lead Dan to create his television production company, Schneider's Bakery, named after his father's business of the same name. But Dan wasn't making cookies and cakes, but hit television series. Everything from iCarly to Victorious to Drake and Josh to Zoe 101, Dan Schneider had some sort of hand in it. The shows that Dan produced at Nickelodeon became massively successful. Unfortunately, because they were such money makers, no one seemed to want to stir the pot if things were questionable or even downright abusive. According to one source, Angelique Bates, a regular on all that before she was replaced by Amanda Bynes, suffered in silence during production. When interviewed in 2016, Bates claimed that she was physically, emotionally, mentally abused in front of the producers and cast members by a family member while on the set of All That. Apparently, Child Protective Services was even called to the set in 1996, though producers convinced her not to say anything. Nothing was ever done to help Bates. Her abuse was known by most on set, but no one spoke up about it due to worries of it causing unwanted controversy. She rarely spoke of her abusive childhood for most of her life, but she's been more open about it in recent years. Angelique claims that she was only 12 years old when her nightmare began, but the show she worked on simply turned its back on her. Not only do I blame Nickelodeon for this, but Dan too. This set an extremely dangerous precedent. 
By ignoring child abuse on set, the company may as well have posted a giant sign saying the welfare of children is unimportant here. Unfortunately, there isn't a ton of information on what happened to Angelique, and though she has spoken out, not many sources have reported on the topic. Even so, Dan had become untouchable at that point. So if Nickelodeon allegedly was letting Bates' abuser get away with such heinous acts, I can only imagine what they would let Dan get away with. Not that I have to imagine, as we'll be getting to it in just a moment. But just to illustrate the point here, according to one source, in a report for the New York Times in 2007, writer Jonathan D. marveled at an unusual situation. Nickelodeon had ordered 13 episodes of a show without knowing the title, cast, or even seeing a script for a pilot. At first, I thought I must have heard this wrong. 13 episodes of a concept, D wrote. How was it possible that a network could already have scheduled a season's worth of a show that no one there seemed to know the first thing about? A Nickelodeon executive, D wrote, simply shrugged and said, it's Dan. That anecdote demonstrates the supreme level of confidence and reliance that Nickelodeon had in Dan Schneider, the prolific showrunner, producer, and writer who had a powerful force at the channel for 24 years. And I'll admit, I'm not familiar with the television world at all. And, you know, those of you that might be, you know, can let me know if this is unusual or not, but it seems unusual to me. Personally, I've never really heard of a channel buying that many episodes without any type of script. But hey, as Dee said, it's Dan. The faith they had in him and the power he had within the network can't be understated. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty details of what was the underbelly of Nickelodeon while Dan Schneider was there, we're gonna go ahead and take a quick break to thank today's sponsors at the beginning because we're gonna get into a lot of dark stuff and Lord knows this episode is not probably monetized by YouTube. So let's just take a moment to thank today's sponsors. As the weather is getting warmer and in some places really damn hot, the last thing you probably wanna do is be super sweaty in your kitchen cooking over a flaming hot stove. And also ordering takeout every single meal kind of sucks too. And that's why I'm obsessed with Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest delivers delicious harvest bowls, flatbread, smoothies, and all more built on organic fruits and vegetables right to your door. And it takes minutes to prepare. And I love knowing that the food I'm eating is actually good for me. And they also offer Daily Harvest Scoops, which is their plant-based ice cream. That's a new thing. It's a perfect sweet treat. I told you guys I love pistachio and they have like this pistachio crunch one. It is so damn good, but they so many other flavors like this decadent looking chocolate one that I just, I'm, I'm eyeballing it very politely. Daily Harvest is all about leaving the earth in a better place than they found it, not just for us, but for future generations to come. They focus on increasing biodiversity, increasing organic farming practices, reducing food waste, and even prioritizing recyclable and compostable packaging. Daily Harvest is delicious food built on whole organic fruits and vegetables that conveniently stays fresh in your freezer so it's ready when you are, really the whole package. So this summer, stay cool, calm, and and collected. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter code casket to get $25 off your first box. That's code casket for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com, dailyharvest.com. This episode is also sponsored by Babbel. Now you guys know the deal. I love Babbel. You probably love Babbel too. Learning a new language sucks. And it seems like the older I get, the harder it is for me to recall upon past languages that I've learned or retain new languages that I'm trying to learn. And that's why I'm so excited to work with Babbel, the number one selling language learning app. From ordering at restaurants, to asking for directions, to gaining just a deeper understanding of the culture, Babbel makes the whole process of learning a new language addictively fun and easy with lessons that are 15 minutes or less. And you guys know I'm picking up Italian again. I used to live there as some of you might know, and I love revisiting. I'm hoping to go back next year and I love the Naples area. That's where I lived when I was there. And I just wanna go back and soak up all the history and culture and just the amazing food too. And of course, I want to be able to have at least a casual conversation with some old friends and people that I'm gonna see again when I go out there. So Babbel is excellent at getting me the head start that I need on that. But you don't have to learn just Italian. They've got over 14 different languages, which also includes like Spanish, Spanish, French, and Italian too. So if you wanna get started with Babbel and get a three month subscription, you'll actually get an additional three months for free. So you'll actually be getting six months for the price of three. Make sure you go to babbel.com and use promo code casket. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com code casket for an extra three months for free. Of course, though we are going to talk about the allegations against Dan today, I promise you that it's also important to know who he was hanging around with for context sake. 
After all, Dan was still relatively young when he got involved in this industry. So I wanted to see who was influencing him and the less than savory reputation that Dan has surrounded himself with. The most known of these was a man named Brian Peck. All that debuted in 1994, but after years on air, it grew a bit stale. Dan started the show fresh with a new cast and new sketches and it paid off. There was a double digit rebound in ratings with the new format. Brian Peck's role in this was that he became the show's dialogue coach. An actor and voiceover artist himself, Brian Peck and Dan worked together in multiple different settings. The most alarming of which was that they would hold a comedy boot camp for children with no parent supervision. Not much is said of this boot camp itself. One source refers to it as a grooming camp. One woman, a former child star, claims that you had the very best chance of getting discovered by the pool during these grooming camps where children were encouraged to partake in pool activities while parents were at seminars. Needless to say, it's pretty damn alarming that these producers would be so close to these kids, fully aware that the parents weren't going to be around. She also explains that the children were between the ages of 13 to 22. It's not as if any of the men like Dan were certified childcare specialists or anything. Parents would leave their kids under the care of these Nickelodeon executives. And if they knew that they didn't, then they simply wouldn't get casting calls. If they asked questions like this woman's mother did, they were cut. While I can't confirm if abuse happened at this pool, at the very least, multiple sources have confirmed that Schneider and Brian Peck were working together. And as for Brian Peck's reputation, well, that speaks for itself too. Apparently Brian Peck was sent to prison for 16 months after admitting two counts of abusing a Nickelodeon child actor. The Daily Mail wrote in 2015, perhaps most disturbingly, he is only prohibited from direct contact with children, not from being part of productions in which children are acting. Meaning that since being convicted, he has worked on a Disney show and a horror movie set in a high school. He played a sex ed teacher according to the movie's credits. Peck 54 was convicted in 2004. Peck was convicted of a lewd act against a child and oral copulation of a person under 16. In court documents obtained by Daily Mail Online, the victim is only named as John Doe to protect his identity. The child did not want his identity revealed for fear of it having a negative effect on his career. I know that Daily Mail is not exactly the best source here, but again, unfortunately, there seems to be very few sources speaking up against Peck or Nickelodeon's abuse of executives. Even more alarmingly, some sources state that not only did he work on The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, but it seems like Disney was fully aware of the charges against him when they hired him as well, though Disney is another story. In addition to Brian Peck, Dan had connections to another convicted child rapist, Marty Weiss. Marty Weiss, according to Deadline, is the Hollywood talent manager whose company rep child actors that had landed roles on such series such as Nickelodeon's iCarly and Disney's Good Luck Charlie, as well as on network shows and movies. June 1st, 2012 in Van Nuys, California, he pleaded no contest during a pretrial hearing on two charges of oral copulation with a child under the age of 14. He was sentenced to a year in jail and five years probation. The sentence was suspended for time served and he will be released today. Weiss must register as a sex offender and enter a treatment program and he is not permitted to be in the presence of anyone under 18 without another adult present. Weiss was arrested last November after the victim and former client told police in an affidavit he was sexually assaulted by Weiss 30 to 40 times over a three year period when the boy was 11 and 12 years old. Police searched his apartment at the time of Weiss's arrest and set bail at triple the normal amount because they suspected there could be more victims. Weiss dissolved his company soon after. Now, I don't believe that Dan is guilty of abuse simply by associating with these people, however, If he had a nickel for every time he worked alongside a sexual predator, he'd have two nickels. And that's not a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. The takeaway here isn't that Dan saw this behavior and thought he'd partake in it. I don't believe that's what happened. What I am more inclined to believe is that Dan saw how little Nickelodeon protected their child stars and knew that if he chose to act on his own desires, he would be sure to get away with it. Other sources out there refer to Brian, Marty, Dan, and two other Nickelodeon employees as the Creep Club, and there's even been change.org petitions to demand Nickelodeon stop hiring sexual predators. The other two men are Easel Channel and Jason M. Handy, although I'm unaware if Dan actually worked with either of them. According to the petition, a Nickelodeon production assistant named Jason Michael Handy used his position to get the email addresses and phone numbers of children on set and began sexually exploiting at least two young girls. Per LA Times reporting, court testimony revealed that during the taping of the TV series Cousin Skeeter, Handy befriended a nine-year-old girl and began visiting her at her home. On one occasion while playing video games in her bedroom, he repeatedly kissed her, she told the court. 
He also emailed naked photos of himself to an 11-year-old child he met on the set of another program, The Amanda Show, according to her testimony. Easel Ethan Channel, a temporary production assistant at Nickelodeon Animation Studio, was arrested for molesting a 14-year-old boy after inviting him over on a tour of the studio. Nickelodeon had sent its message loud and clear. They did little to nothing to prevent child abuse, and Dan Schneider, it seemed, got that message. Dan had people in the palm of his hand during the Nickelodeon Golden Age. Not only had he created some incredibly memorable television shows, but he also had an incredibly important thing, trust. Dan himself has discussed this in an interview with the AV Club. When asked the question, how does your experience as a teen actor affect how you deal with the kids on your shows? Dan answered, It puts me in a very unique position because I've seen it from both sides. It helps me because I know how actors think. I know what's important to them. And I have a very clear perspective because I starred in two TV shows and I guessed it on several. I know the emotions and the thoughts that actors have about what they're doing. I understand them very, very clearly. The kids I work with are not just kids, all the actors because I hire adults too and the actors I work with, I know I was an actor. To them, I'm in their club. They accept me as one of them because they know it's been my face in front of the camera and I've had to do exactly what they're doing now. There's a level of trust and respect that I think a producer that hasn't done that wouldn't get. They trust me. And Dan isn't wrong here. Having been an actor, he can speak the language. He can communicate with his stars the way someone only who's been on that side of things might be able to. And that's a good quality to have. I don't mean to dismiss or diminish that. Yet at the same time, while he's talking about all this respect they have for him, it seems that Dan forgot that respect goes both ways. Dan saying how he is accepted by these child stars, but that doesn't make him a child himself. That doesn't mean that he can be so overly friendly that he's inviting kids to his place for sleepovers and pool parties. There are still boundaries that shouldn't be crossed. And unfortunately, Dan didn't seem to give a damn about those boundaries. On a podcast called Revenge of the Sis, one man claims that Schneider held pool parties with children without other adult supervision. This goes back to the mid early nineties. He would spend extremely large amounts of time with kids in their dressing rooms. He would get mad if the talent manager was going in there and he was in the middle of talking to them. He would berate the poor PA that was just trying to do their job. This isn't anything new to the industry and it's not new to Nickelodeon either, the man states. Some of Dan's actions to me anyway, seem more childish than anything. For example, one YouTuber Sloan has one video compiling a bunch of behind the scene clips at iCarly where Dan can be seen playing pranks on Miranda and Jeanette. This doesn't scream that he had the intent of a child predator to me, but that he's kind of like the Michael Scott kind of boss where he's immature to the point of making it an uncomfortable work environment. And I'm talking the obnoxious Michael Scott from season one for those of you that know The Office. Yet it's the pool parties that take the sort of childish jokes and the I'm one of the gang attitude into dangerous and disturbing territory. I don't want to speculate what happened there. There's a part of me that just doesn't want to know, but this parent-free pool party goes beyond irresponsible and negligent into upsetting territory. Another aspect of Dan's upsetting behavior is the foot stuff. Now, look, if you have a foot fetish, I don't care. You do you, don't put that on children, okay? I think it's fucking gross, feet gross me out. I feared this when it came time to recording this episode. I knew I was gonna have to talk about it and it just, ugh. it just grosses me out so much. I just think feet are so fucking gross. But foot fetish or not, don't post or request photos of minor's feet so frequently and consistently that people are genuinely concerned and speculating about your intentions. There are so, so many cases of this that most people are convinced that Dan knew exactly what he was doing and that it crossed the line into sexualization. For example, one former child actress, which she spoke about the pool earlier, went on Revenge of the Sis podcast and says that for an audition, she and other kids were told to take off their shoes before going into the audition room in front of Dan, the producer. You gotta take off your shoes, run around in front of the camera and talk about how much you love being barefoot. This woman says her agent advised her. She also explains that all the kids were wearing short shorts and spaghetti straps and less reserved clothing for the audition as well. Other sources point to his online behavior around feet also being odd and troubling as well. Take for example, in 2013, the Twitter account for Sam and Cat, one of the shows created by Schneider, which put out a tweet asking kids to submit pictures of their feet. Unsuspecting children who were fans of the show did what was asked and sent in pictures of their feet. While this isn't necessarily a sign of anything amiss, this isn't the only instance of Schneider discussing young children's feet and toes on social media. If this was the only foot incident, I might be able to chalk it off to some off-putting promotion, maybe. 
Yet he has so, so many tweets similar to this one that you just can't help but question where Dan's mind is at. He would frequently post photos of the feet of his young female stars and would caption them things like, this toe belongs to one of the stars of one of my shows. Can you guess whose it is? And weird fucking things of that nature. Episodes of shows such as one in Victorious where the characters use toxic fish to smooth their feet also featured feet way more than you'd think a kid's show should show. A lot of this foot fetish language does remain rumored and alleged, though according to one source, former actors of his show remain mixed and it reads, on a recent podcast, actor Noah Monk, he played Gibby on iCarly, was asked about Schneider. Did Monk ever witness sinister behavior? Did Schneider have a foot fetish? And did he take advantage of his position as a Nickelodeon producer to pursue that foot fetish? I was sort of, I mean, if that shit went on, I'm fucking like, that's devastating to me because I don't see him in that light, you know? So watching clips on YouTube, conspiracy videos accusing Schneider of more than just having a foot fetish and shit of that is crazy, but I mean, the foot fetish shit is like, okay, bro, come on. Like, I never really noticed that when I was 15 on the show, but of course, looking in retrospect, it's like, okay, okay, hinting that Schneider was obsessed with feet. Responding to a question of the other, more troubling rumors about Schneider, Monk said, nah, I don't know. And I never, like, I never observed, like saw anything like that or got hints of that. It might be baseless rumors, but I don't wanna speak. Like, what if some shit comes out? I don't wanna be on record being like, no, 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 you know? So I have no clue. It's understandable why these actors don't wanna feed into conspiracy theories as some of them are pretty intense and if true, would be incredibly damaging and even criminal. For example, two rumors out there are that Dan Schneider impregnated Amanda Bynes when she was a teenager and then forced her to have an abortion. The other claims that he is the real father of Jamie Lynn Spears' child. Even if Dan has behaved inappropriately, I'm not comfortable accusing him of these crimes when as of writing this, there's no concrete proof that this has been presented, nor has Amanda or Jamie Lynn confirmed these allegations. Rumors aside, there's some controversial clips circulating online as well, where characters from Dan's shows are seemingly placed in adult scenarios or given adult dialogue. For example, Ariana Grande's character Kat says in one clip that she wants to say a sentence no one in the history of mankind has ever said, and then blurts out, my uvula got stuck between that hamster's toes. Then, I'm soaking wet, someone bring me the ocean. After that, she tried to fit her big toe in her mouth, tries to get juice from a potato while holding it in a weirdly suggestive manner and telling it to give up the juice. Personally, yeah, it makes me cringe having all of this context behind who Dan is and the environment Nickelodeon had created for these child stars. Adult jokes may get snuck into a child show from time to time, but I would argue that it's very different when a cartoon character does it versus child actors literally acting out potential fetishes. Does it mean that this was intentional, malicious sexualization? I can't really say for sure. At best, it's meant to be shock humor and it does a poor job. And at worst, in its negligence, these clips are sexualizing kids you really do have to kind of see the clips for yourself to make up your own mind, but it's just like, I don't know, the feet thing is just mad uncomfortable, man. It's mad uncomfortable. The thing that's especially important to recognize here is that Dan, as far as I know, wasn't made to leave Nickelodeon, by the way, because of any of these allegations. Instead, when word broke that Dan was leaving and reported to have received $7 million to do so, more suspicion and accounts of his inappropriate behavior began. The actual reason for his departure from Nickelodeon is a mystery. And according to a joint statement, both parties agreed it was a mutual time to part ways since Dan's projects were coming to an end. Dan left recently after 30 years with the network and under a cloud of suspicion. I don't know if Nickelodeon wanted to get ahead of the rumors or if it was simply making sense for Dan to leave because well, his shows in the 90s and early 2000s brand of comedy simply just wasn't working anymore. Only him and Nickelodeon will know for sure. Thankfully, as the spotlight was briefly shown on Dan, his victims have taken the opportunity to step forward and recount how uncomfortable they felt working with Dan and how abusive he truly was. One of these people speaking out is Jeanette McCurdy, who is not a part of the iCarly reboot series now featured on Paramount+. When she was featured on the Michaela Peterson podcast, Jeanette said the following. There's a lot of abuse that happens. I worked with an incredibly emotionally abusive producer. Even right now, my face gets hot thinking about it. He would say things like, you would work at yogurt land if you didn't work for me. And he would just scream. He was like the bad teacher, very villainous and almost mustache twirly in his personality. Although this isn't about Dan Schneider, Jeanette also talks about how her mom was teaching her anorexia and she thought it was normal. Anorexia for me was 11 to 15, she says. Dan may not have known or contributed, I can't say for sure, but hearing how child actors are treated is so disheartening. 
so many of her experiences remind me of things that like Shirley Temple or Judy Garland also went through as a child. And there will be an upcoming episode on Judy Garland as well, which is not gonna be great. If you do want to hear more about her own experiences, Jeanette does have a podcast called Empty Inside and her episode Fish Out of Water talks about her time on Nickelodeon. She's also made Vine and TikTok videos that seem to speak on or exaggerate her experiences in a dark humor sort of way. One where she acts as if she's had a breakdown, has lipstick smeared on her face, her hair is a mess, and then she says, hey, Dan Schneider, I know you're watching my Vine. Look what you've done to me. If that's her way of coping, I'm absolutely not one to judge her for it. Others say she was mimicking Amanda Bynes who did suffer an emotional breakdown some years after the Amanda show ended. As for if Amanda blames Dan Schneider for her breakdown, I'm not certain. One source writes, while working together, Schneider's suggestive and short temper with Amanda Bynes and other younger actresses steadily went from hushed rumors to open secrets. As the years went on, fans began to notice a change in Bynes' temperament as well. Their suspicion began to point towards inappropriate behavior within the walls of the TV network. As Bynes and other young teens filmed more and more scenes increasingly suggestive for their young age, certain character idiosyncrasies raised questions about Schneider's behavior behind the scenes. One scene in particular included a young Ariana Grande on another of Schneider's shows, iCarly. Twitter fans who have grown up since the episode aired noted how the episode's focus on feet likely carried extra meaning. As time went on, the writing of Dan Schneider's shows came under more scrutiny. In the eyes of fans, the executive's jokes surrounding allegations of inappropriate behavior after the episodes aired further implicated him for Amanda Bynes' downward spiral. The trouble is that most of these sources are Film Daily or podcasts or AV Club or Diamondback News who have a photo of Amanda Bynes and Dan Schneider in a hot tub together on their front page. And they even admit that it's largely fans pointing to her relationship with Snyder causing this breakdown. Since we simply don't know, it's again, dangerous to speculate here. Whether or not you believe Schneider did more than host pool parties and push his obsession with feet onto his child stars, no one has stepped forward and said, he raped me. So we don't have concrete allegations, let alone evidence. So then what do we have? At the end of the day, we know that Dan created a horrible work environment and largely contributed to Nickelodeon's biggest and most disturbing flaw enabling child predators. Nickelodeon didn't do anything to protect their child stars, and as a result, children suffered the consequences. If not at Schneider's hands, then Easel's, Jason's, or Brian's. Some sources argue that even though the hashtag MeToo movement has by and large been fantastic for women of Hollywood exposing men like Harvey Weinstein's and Bill Cosby's of the world, it's left children actors behind. The Northeastern University Political Review says, in 1988, Victor Salva, the director of Clown House, was convicted of sexual assault. His victim was Nathan Forrest Winters, a 12-year-old actor. 15 months in prison, Salva returned to the director's chair, working with Disney on the movie Powder. This garnered serious backlash as parents were outraged that Disney, a children's entertainment company, would work with a child predator. Salva's powder collaborators defended him, arguing that the director was not working directly with children and that no one knew about his prior conviction. After they became aware of his conviction, a producer for the movie argued that Salva had paid his debt to society and thus deserved another chance. John Crick Falusi, the director of Nickelodeon's Ren and Stimpy, is still celebrated as an animation pioneer despite his history of sexual harassment. He formed mentorships with two underage girls, aspiring animators, buying them art supplies before sexually assaulting them. It was an open secret that Crick Falusi was seeing underage girls in Hollywood and even living with one, but no one condemned him. Tony Mora, an art director at Nickelodeon at the time, reflected that Crick Falusi would often sexually harass female artists, particularly teenage girls. It's always been there, he remarked, and yet Crick Falusi still has a career. In 2014, he worked with Miley Cyrus on her Bangers cover arc, and in 2016, he screened his short film, Cans Without Labels, at a prestigious animation festival. Despite the allegations, Nickelodeon hung his portrait at Nickelodeon Studios, honoring him and his legacy. Only when BuzzFeed News got Kick Falusi to admit that he had an underage girlfriend did Nickelodeon remove the portrait. Children deserve to have their voices heard, especially when it comes to something like this. Nickelodeon may claim it has toughened up their hiring process by conducting background checks, but I think we still have a right to be wary. California itself passed the Hollywood Child Protection Act requiring anyone working with a child actor to be fingerprinted and pass an FBI background check, screening for registered sex offenders. Yet publicists don't comply with this law and it largely remains unenforced. 
Deadline reports that this law was put in place to stop men like Robert Villard, who was convicted of possessing child porn, continued to serve as a publicist, manager, acting coach, and photographer of child stars, some of whom went on to become major movie stars. He was arrested in 2001 after a police raid of his home in which more CP was found. Yet Villard just received probation until he was arrested again in 2005 and continued working with children under a different name. We were very supportive of the legislation, said Duncan Crabtree Ireland, sag after as COO and general counsel. And we remain insistent that it was necessary. It's clear that this applies to photographers, managers, coaches, and publicists. And we'd like to see that any of these types of professionals who work with child performers are registered as is required by the law. We are going to reach out to the people who should be registered under this statute and make sure they are aware of their obligation to register. And it's distressing, he added, that so many industry professionals have failed to register. The whole point of having this in the first place was to ensure that industry people who work regularly with children would be subjected to background checks. Hollywood's publicists, however, haven't gotten the message. A database maintained by the state's Department of Industrial Relations lists 292 valid permit holders who are legally allowed to work with child actors. It's intended as a guide to parents, but a deadline review of every permit holder reveals that not a single publicist holds a child performer services permit. So let that one sink in for a moment. As of 2018, when that was written, and you know, I don't know about present time in 2021, but not a single publicist bothered to receive this permit and register. This should be made mandatory. Parents should demand it for it should be for what's working for their kids to protect them. Yet these basic, basic protections simply aren't happening. Dan Schneider may not be the cause of everything wrong at Nickelodeon, but he was a symptom of it. And Nickelodeon, a symptom of a consistent, frequent industry abuse that we've come to expect out of Hollywood. Now, this is actually where I was intending on ending today's episode, but a recent news article has come out saying that Dan is planning a return to Hollywood. They've also addressed these allegations and some investigations about Dan have uncovered certain things. So according to the New York Times, Online denizens posted compilations that stitched together scenes from Schneider's shows, videos he has taken on set and pictures of him with child actors to raise questions about his behavior with the young people he worked with. Shots in the shows of bare feet were presented as evidence of a fetish. Other scenes were dissected and discussed as scripts of moments of wink wink sexual innuendo acted out by a teenage cast. Schneider says he was well aware of the postings, which he described as ridiculous. He said it was sad that social media companies can freely push forward any lie. Kids find feet goofy and funny, he said, and there was no effort to sexualize his young stars. The comedy, he said, was totally innocent. But the internet noise has garnered the attention of Schneider's bosses by 2018, when the hashtag MeToo movement had arrived. Viacom CBS interviewed dozens of employees, according to four people with knowledge of the review who said they were not authorized to discuss it. The review found no evidence of sexual misconduct by Snyder, the people said, but it did find he could be verbally abusive to people he worked with. Dan's claimed there's never been any mistreatment, even those who've worked with him to this day say his chumminess with his employees was unsettling and uncomfortable. If Dan isn't a child predator at the bare minimum, he sounds terrible to work for. I'm not sure when or if he will actually be planning that return to Hollywood, but he seems intent on doing so and dismissing any allegations against him. So with that being said, that's where we're going to end today's small peek into the window of Nickelodeon and Dan Schneider and what the heck went on over there. So I hope you learned something from today's episode. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you wanna keep contact with me outside of these episodes, make sure to click on my Linktree link in the description box. It will show links for my Twitter and all my different social media, Twitch, Discord server, you name it, it's all there. So thank you so much for making it to another episode. I love you all and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.